Okay, so we're going to get started again here. We're turning to our Transportation Advisory Board meeting. So uh, we'll invite our Transportation Advisory Board members to uh, uh, re return with their video and uh, uh, get rolling again. And uh, give everyone just a minute to fully get back. And then we'll invite uh, uh, Stacy to uh, let us know if there are any um, members of the public wishing to be heard at this point. Stacy? It looks like we do have one user show a name. Okay, sounds good. Well, um, We'll invite that uh, caller in just one second. Just a reminder uh, to the rest of the uh, folks on the call here just to uh, keep your mute button on there uh, when you're not speaking, just to make sure that uh, we don't have any crosstalk taking place. So, all right, for the individual who uh, uh, is on the phone here, um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Right. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the, the members of the board for your public service. My name is Rebecca Parrott. Today, I speak to you as a concerned citizen in an attempt to shine a light on a neighborhood that needs city attention. It is my belief that Longmont has not done enough, enough for Northern Longmont. North Longmont is wrought with pedestrian and bicycle safety concerns, yet I see little evidence of any capital improvement projects that address the safety of North Longmont's residents. North Longmont sidewalks and roads are not good enough, especially on the arterial highways. Last week, a car driving eastbound on 17th Street plowed over the sidewalk adjacent to Janet Pearson's property between Atwood and Collier. This is the 12th time that something like this has happened. This isn't about drunk driving and watching the road. This is about the fundamental design of the roads and sidewalks in North Longmont. For example, when walking down 17th, and you cross Atwood, all of a sudden, the eastbound right hand lane goes from about 20 feet wide to less than 11 feet wide, less than the width of a small driveway. And the sidewalk is right next to it. It is my belief that this funneling and road narrowing of the road contributed to why that drunk driver would have killed any pedestrian on that sidewalk. And, and um, 17th has multiple cases of these road narrowings. There's no shoulders on 17th, and it is a four lane road. It is also the location of many families' front yards. 17th is just one road in North Longmont like that. 9th Street, 19th, Collier, they all have instances of road narrowing with sidewalks adjacent to the road. I'd also suggest that the lack of attention in the North depicts an underlying disparity of the public projects in the city. North Longmont is one of the densest and lowest income parts of the city and many of the people are renters who are unable or unwilling to perform their civic duties to bring up their concerns to the city. Yet because the density of these areas, the, any capital improvement project would impact the most people. We all have things that we think our neighborhoods could improve upon, and I'm not trying to devalue other concerns. I just suggest that the city prioritize public safety over what to me sound like city niceties. I challenge each and every one of you to take a walk down nice and walk down 17th and see how it feels. See what it feels like to know that if you trip and fall, you'll be falling face first into traffic. And see what it feels like to know that if you stick your hand out, you can touch a vehicle that's speeding by. You might not live here, but the neighborhood and the people in it need your representation. I've seen the plat maps and the challenges of these roads, and I really do sympathize with the city on how to address the issues. It, it is a challenge and it might need some creativity to figure out what to do, but just because something is hard doesn't mean that it isn't the right thing to do. I ask that the advisory board and the city focus on the public safety of these sidewalks in North Longmont, which is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Good to hear your voice there. I hope you're doing well. I'm sorry to hear about the incident that happened on 17th Street. Can we invite Tyler to be able to uh, 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 come on back here for, for just a moment there and uh, uh, to see if if uh, uh, he has any comments there or or, or thoughts from uh, um, you know from an engineering perspective about this stretch of 17th Street or any next steps. 
I appreciate the feedback and opportunity to comment. I think that, as Ms. Parrott mentioned, there are a lot of challenges in this area. A lot that we're looking at, I think in general, um, our design standards have definitely evolved over time. At, at one point, we we had the sidewalks attached to the street. I think that's definitely a change that we've made for the better, where now we're looking at the detached walks, any new builds, we're not attaching the walks to the street. Um, I heard Ninth Avenue in there, um, part of the discussion. I'm not clear on exactly which parts of Ninth Avenue, but we are looking at a project this year on Ninth Avenue between over in Kaufman Street, where we would be doing some type of road diet, reallocating those lanes to create kind of a three lane section, bike lanes, which would provide some additional buffer for the sidewalk, similar to what we did on Sunset a couple of years ago. So that is an example of some of the projects we've done for some of those issues. But the 17th, yeah, it probably needs a, a closer look into some of the issues going on there. Thank you for, uh doing your due diligence on, on that in the uh, the weeks ahead. Great, Phil? I just wanted to add, we're, we're following the Dr. Cog presentation now with our um, equitable carbon-free transportation roadmap presentation. And we were, we we're gonna address some of those equity issues in that, in that plan. So I'll just give you a heads up that we will be talking about this later tonight as well. Great, sounds good, thank you. Stacy, do we have anyone else on the phone at this point? Um, the only other caller I show is, it looks like Alvin Bedell Sanchez. I'm not sure if he's calling in as public or for the group tonight. He's with Dr. Okay. And that looks like that's all then. Okay, great, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Tyler and Stacy and uh, Phil. And uh, we will jump ahead to our information item here from the uh, tweak that we did to the uh, the agenda. So let me uh, turn it on over to uh, uh, Lisa and um, let you uh, lead the discussion for this next section there on uh, uh, the 2050 Metro Vision Transportation Plan. All right, thank you, Chair. Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Hood, and I am the Public Engagement Specialist for Dr. Cog. And we are so excited to come and talk to you today about the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, we're actually going out to all of the transportation advisory boards, just like you around the region, um, to the local governments that have those. And I am just so grateful that you you all volunteered your time to be on a board like this and to advise your city on transportation issues. I also wanted to do a couple shout outs before I get into the introductions. First to Tyler, because he's one of the only people that's ever pronounced my name correctly on the first try. So he, great job, Tyler. Um, and then also I just wanted to say thank you to Phil for plugging the Citizens Academy, which is one of my other main roles at Dr. Cog. And I just want to second that um, I think it's a really great opportunity for um, interested community members like you all, or if you have friends or family who are interested in transportation issues or demographics or civic engagement um, with our virtual format this year, um, especially for Longmont folks, uh, it might be perfectly ideal. So um, yeah, thank you, Phil. And then I also wanted to say um, a hello to Joan Peck because she is our uh, Dr. Cog director, she's on our board of directors, um, the representative for Longmont. So great to see you here as well. <laughs> um, so I'll start with um, introductions of my colleagues who are also here. So you've already heard from me, but Jacob, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks Lisa. Can everyone hear me? Great. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Jacob Rieger. I'm the Long Range Transportation Planning Manager uh, at Dr. Cog. Um, the biggest part of my job at Dr. Cog is actually what we will be discussing tonight, uh, which is the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, so I just want to echo Lisa's comments. You know, really, really, really grateful uh, for your time tonight, having us here, um, and we're excited to have this conversation with you. All right, and I'm also joined by Alvin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alvin. 
Hey, Dr. Sanchez. I'm a transportation planner here at Dr. Cobb. Uh, and similar to Jacob, my uh, I work underneath Jacob, but my primary role is helping with the long range plan, which we'll be discussing today. Alvin. So the three of us will be giving you a short presentation. We've also planned some interactive polling just to kind of facilitate a discussion. Um, and we're hoping to chat with you about transportation. Uh, just some background. I know now we've already thrown out the acronym several times. Dr. Cog, the silliest acronym of them all, stands for the Denver Regional Council of Governments. As you can tell, we take up a lot of land area in the region. And we are composed of 58 member governments, including Longmont. And we have a variety of different um, issues that we handle. And one of those is transportation. So that's what we're here to talk to you about tonight. Um, I'm actually going to try to show a video because we created this cool little video um, to summarize the transportation plan. And hopefully this will work. It's only, well, it's a short video um, that gives you a good overview. We're always on the go, walking, driving, biking. We all have places to be, but how often do we stop to think about everything that makes it possible to get where we need to go? Adding transit. I don't think we're seeing the actual video, Lisa. Darn Sorry. it. I was wondering. I was like, there's yeah. an awkward pause. Let's see. Um, let me, because I'm sharing Microsoft PowerPoint. Let me try again. <laughs> Technical issues are a very fun part of the virtual experience. All right, try this again. Can you hear it this time? Got it. We're always on the okay. go. <laughs> Walking, driving, biking. We all have places to be. But how often do we stop to think about everything that makes it possible to get where we need to go? Adding transit lines, constructing and fixing roads, creating bike paths, all these things make it possible for us to move around the region. They help us connect to the world around us, whether we're going to the grocery store, our jobs or school, to visit with family and friends, or to explore nature. As our region continues growing, we simply can't take for granted that our current infrastructure and systems will always be able to support our population. The Denver Regional Council of Governments brings community leaders together from across 10 counties to decide how our region funds and prioritizes transportation investments. The Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan looks ahead to 2050 so we can prepare for our population's continued growth over the next 30 years. The plan anticipates the region's needs and we're involving residents to learn how we can meet those needs from expanding our public transportation network to improving our roadways to making biking and walking safer and more accessible. Learn more about the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and how you can shape the future of transportation. So that I feel like gives a, a better summary than just our PowerPoint slides. Um, but just want, so wanted to kick that off and I will um, stop sharing. Let me try to get over to PowerPoint. Um, There we go. And I'm going to pass it over to Alvin, who will walk through kind of more of the nuts and bolts of the plan. Thank you, Lisa. So uh, for the 2050 RTP and for any RTP that we work on, uh, we have these that are common throughout each of our developments. So the RTP sets the region's multimodal vision. And by that, we, we do mean multimodal. So we're not just talking about roads and rail. We're also talking about the sidewalk and bicycle facilities, the aviation system in the region. And we're also talking about the impacts that that transportation system has on users and residents. So safety, uh, freight and goods movement. 
you'll hear us discuss how the plan might be fiscally constrained or cost feasible. So we'll be talking about um, just what projects are included in the plan that we were able to prioritize through our solicitation and evaluation process. If you're familiar with our short range plan, the transportation improvement program, uh, any project that's a new road or a road widening or a new rapid transit project that wants to be in the TIP also needs to be in our RTP. Uh, this is one way that we implement our Metro Vision Plan, which is the region's larger guiding document about where we want to be in the future. Uh, this plan is updated every four years, but you can see that we have a 20 to 30 year vision. So we're looking at to 2050 for this development. We work with all the partners in the region. So not just CDOT and RTD, but also our local government partners. So the local governments, the county governments, toll authorities, and then uh, any transportation providers like the airports. And then we also have a couple other functions that we do as the designated MPO for the region. By the time we get to hopefully our board adoption and ultimately the approval from Federal Highway and Federal Transit Administration, this will be about a two year long effort to develop our Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. You can break that up into about four different phases. And with each of those, we've had a public engagement component, each of them. Uh, you can see we're finally coming up on our draft plan review, so that'll actually be going out uh, end of this week, beginning of next week to actually begin our official public review period, where we'll, we'll be continuing to present to the public, to stakeholders like yourselves, and then uh, hopefully ending up in front of our board and committee to adopt this RTP. Regardless of whether we've heard from the public or our two advisory groups and whether that's been a survey or our pop-up events or even our uh, online engagement activities, we've heard some similar themes across each of those phases and from each of those groups. Uh, the biggest one has been investing in quality transit in the region, as well as expanding our sidewalks and our bicycle paths, and also improving safety in the region. Uh, we've taken a number of actions in the last year for each of these, but this plan sets a long range vision for each of those. Uh, compared to that, there's been less interest in building new roads and new highways in the region, and there's also been interest in improving our air quality, so reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and reducing how many vehicle miles are traveled per capita in, in the region. In addition to the public engagement we've been doing, we've also been meeting regularly with our stakeholders. So that could be our county transportation forums where we get all the different local governments within a county together and talk about the transportation issues within that county at a county level, regional level. Um, we were meeting pretty regularly with the Colorado Department of Transportation and the Regional Transportation District almost weekly at some point over the summer as we worked through project solicitation and project evaluation. Uh, we've also been doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with local government, so not just through the county transportation forums, but one-on-one -on -one to discuss their priorities for the, for their, for the long range plan. Then we've had our own committee and board structure that we've been working through over the last two years, providing regular updates, uh, doing workshops with them, developing the framework that we use to solicit projects, evaluate projects, and then ultimately bringing forward to them those investment priorities that they adopted at the end of last year that have informed how we've uh, built out the plan that will be available for public review at the end of this week. Getting into the meat of the plan, what folk are most interested in, uh, we'll focus on uh, some current conditions of some six themes, six, six important topics we heard from the public. Uh, and then we'll be discussing what some of those investments look like, just at a high level, providing some examples, and then what some potential outcomes are for the region that we hope our investment choices will improve in the region. Now, there are four components of the plan. Uh, we'll be focusing on regionally funded projects. So these are new projects that are included in the plan using federal or state dollars. Uh, we also have projects that we said we would bring from the last plan into the new plan. So from 2040 into 2050. There's also projects that we know the local governments are gonna be working on. So those could be new roads, road widenings. Um, those could be by local governments, county governments, or even toll authorities, which is projects we need to have in our plan to show. And then a significant investment is just in what we call categories or allocations. So we don't list every sidewalk project, every bus route that we know is in the region, but we know there's gonna be significant investment in those types of projects. So that's just an allocation that we show in the plan. But the focus of the presentation will be these new regionally funded projects. And I'll pass it over to Jacob. Thank you, Alvin. So as Alvin mentioned, we wanted to 
kind of talk through what's in this plan uh, regarding these six themes. And these themes really correspond to uh, some of the major things that we heard through both the public and stakeholder uh, engagement process over the last year and a half. So let's start with safety, um, you know, really is, you know, our highest priority, your highest priority um, really across the region and beyond in terms of, you know, wanting to improve safety outcomes in this region. So you're seeing a lot of data and a lot of information on this slide, and this is what the next few slides will look like. In the interest of time, I'm not going to cover all of this, but um, both, you know, really wanted to give you a sense of what's in the plan that you'll see starting next week in terms of kind of the profile of the issue, um, some data around each of these issues, um, and then what's really in the plan to address it. And for each of these issues, what's in the plan is a combination of kind of what I'd call sort of major projects, um, you know, really sort of, you know, capacity multimodal type projects, um, like some of the ones that you see listed here. Um, but there's also a lot of programmatic and, and sort of smaller investments that we don't necessarily identify projects for um, just yet, but we make those allocations in the financial plan. And I think it's important to clarify for each of these topics, because we're such a large region, um, in our regional transportation plan, you know, we're covering an area that's um, parts of 10 counties, you know, almost three and a half million people. Um, we really sort of concentrate on listing, you know, the major multimodal projects and then some of the smaller projects, you know, some of the things even that you started talking about tonight in terms of like local sidewalks, local streets. Uh, we don't list those projects in the plan. We focus on the big projects, um, but we do make sure that our financial plan includes all, all of the allocations from all of our partners including local governments that help make our transportation system work. So this one is talking about active transportation. This is really any type of transportation that's not engine powered. So if you're walking, um, bicycling, rolling, um, whatever it may be, this is really what this is about. Um, Dr. Cog worked on an active transportation plan uh, that we adopted, adopted, I think just about a year and a half ago. Um, that plan has actually become part of this larger uh, regional transportation plan. Um, and then, like the other slides, you see some of the major projects that um, in this category that will be in the regional transportation plan. Uh, one I'll highlight in the Longmont area is the St. Brain Greenway, um, as well as the RTD uh, Rail Trail in Boulder County. And then you see a few other projects around the region. Uh, similar to safety and the other slides, um, again, both some major projects, but also some programmatic investments in the financial plan on this topic. Um, air quality is obviously an important issue. You certainly don't need me to tell you that. Um, there's a lot that both Dr. Cog and our partners at the regional and state level, as well as the local level do um, around air quality. This one's a little bit different because it, you don't typically have an air quality project, you know, per se um, in the plan sort of individually, um, but we handle this in several different ways. Uh, we've started to incorporate um, House Bill 1261, um, the greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction, the climate action plan. Um, and we anticipate as that work gets finalized, we'll be amending um, this plan to further incorporate some of the requirements that it will have uh, for regional transportation plans like this. And then the big thing that we always do um, at Dr. Cog, and frankly, it's a federal requirement that we do, is um, we make sure that the entire network and program of projects that we include in the regional transportation plan um, meet what's known as emissions budgets that are set for us by the state. Uh, through the state implementation plan for air quality. So we have done that air quality modeling work for this plan. Um, that this plan will, uh, the projects in this plan uh, will meet the air quality conformity standards. So again, this is really just to highlight um, that this continues to be a major issue in this region and something that we've been focused on as we've put the plan together. Um, multimodal mobility, again, you kind of see a lot on this slide. The idea here is that um, you know, this plan is about many things, but in one way, it's ultimately about the scarce allocation of, of dollars, just like you all locally, us at the regional level, state level, national level, you know, we just don't have enough dollars for transportation. We don't have enough to do everything that we want to do. So when we put this plan together, one of the things that we really consciously focused on was the notion that, you know, we really want the best of the best of these projects and investments to fund. Um, and what I mean by that is that any of these major projects, we didn't want them to just serve a single purpose, even roadway projects in this plan. You know, we really wanted them to be multimodal. We wanted them to have active transportation or transit components, or if we funded a transit project in the plan, you know, maybe that's also a safety project. You know, we wanted these projects that would do multiple things and make the best use of the resources that um, are being used to, you know, to allocate dollars toward them in this plan. So really the point of this slide um, is just kind of demonstrate, you know, the variety of modes, 
um, that this plan covers um, and how we try to integrate those modes in the projects and the plan that we put together. Um, freight is another important topic, um, a little bit harder to resonate with us on an average day, but you know, if we think about our collective experience during the pandemic, I'm sure that we've all gotten, you know, grocery deliveries and food deliveries, um, Amazon packages and all those, you know, all those sorts of um, things being delivered to us. Um, so freight is really important um, in terms of, you know, our ability to function our economy, um, the effect on the roadways, um, you know, railroads, trucking, you know, many dimensions to freight. Um, so we do have several freight projects in the plan, uh, similar to uh, some of the other topics in this plan. Um, you know, that Dr. Cog has recently adopted a safety plan, an active transportation plan. We've also recently adopted a freight plan uh, that becomes part of this larger effort that we're talking about tonight with our regional transportation plan. Um, regional transit, I know that's important to you locally. It's important to us as a region. Uh, we have several aspects of transit and regional transit within uh, this regional transportation plan. Um, you see some of the major projects listed um, at the bottom of this slide. Um, one of the things that we've done is based on RTD's regional BRT feasibility study, we felt the long range plan was really an important mechanism to help implement um, that regional BRT study. And so this plan actually defines um, a BRT network of I believe about 10 corridors um, across the region over the next 30 years to start implementing a regional BRT system, which does include State Highway 119 um, in your part of our region. We've also identified several corridors that we're calling transit planning corridors that will get significant uh, financial and planning allocation over the life of this plan to help develop um, the unique transit vision for each of those corridors. So State Highway 7 um, is an important example of one of those types of corridors. Um, and then working with our partners, you know, as Alvin mentioned earlier, obviously RTD was one of our key partners. Um, we were able to include the Northwest Rail uh, Peak Service Plan um, in this long range transportation plan. I will say not really a caveat there because it's in the plan, but just sort of a note that, you know, as RTD picks up, reimagine and continues on that work, just like with House Bill 1261 uh, for greenhouse gas emission reduction, we do anticipate probably in the next year or so um, needing to update this plan or do an amendment to this plan uh, to incorporate the outcomes of the RTD reimagine process once it's complete. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jacob. Now we're gonna talk about all the different ways that you can provide input or get your community members to provide input on this plan. Um, we really need to hear from the public on this. Um, we, like Alvin mentioned, our draft plan will be released for public review starting actually on Friday, so the end of this week. Um, and we would really love you to help spread the word to your contacts um, for you to take a look at the full plan yourself. Um, and we really just want to hear from as many people as possible, um, as this is the transportation system that we will all be using for the next 30 years. So uh, tonight, though, I wanted to talk with you all about kind of these topics that we've raised. Just thinking about the interactive, um, how to make virtual meetings interactive. I, I certainly wish I was meeting you all in person. Um, but virtual meetings are the name of the game now. So we are going to try some interactive web polling with you. And that's really just to facilitate discussion. Sometimes it can be hard to get everybody to talk on a virtual meeting. Um, so we'll try that and see how that goes and just kind of start talking um, and have some opportunities for general discussion as well. There are gonna be several more opportunities uh, to provide input once the plan is released at the end of this week. So don't feel like um, this is your only chance to provide input. And we we certainly know that you haven't seen the full plan yet. So you're really just providing input on these last 10 slides that we've given you. Um, so over the next 30 days, there will be a online on-demand open house. So kind of a website that we've built that people can go through on their own time and go through these topics and kind of the summaries of each and give feedback on that and uh, participate in discussion boards. We're also going to be holding some virtual live public meetings um, where you can have more Q&A with the Dr. Cog planners. We've built an interactive map so you can explore all of these different projects and when they're planned and their funding. Um, and then we'll have the kind of typical um, availability for public comment and then we'll have a public hearing at our Dr. Cog board of directors meeting. So I'm going to jump over to this tool called Mentimeter. And some of you maybe have used this before. 
Um, but it's a pretty nifty little interactive polling tool. If you just want to open another screen on your laptop or your computer, since you're already looking at it, or it can be a little bit easier to um, do it on a smartphone if you have one. And then what you'll do is you'll go to www.menti.com and that's M-E-N-T-I. And Jacob or Alvin, if you wanna throw this in the chat too to make it easier, that'd be good. Um, and then you'll enter the code 74220062. I'll give you a second. Um, we'll do a couple test uh, or just fun, fun questions just to get you familiar with how this thing works. Um, so the first one, I love trivia. So this is the first one. Which of these fun facts about Colorado is not true? And then you'll just use your phone to answer. The road to Mount Evans is the highest paved road in North America. Colorado has the most national parks of any state. No U.S. president or vice president has been born in Colorado. Or Colfax Avenue is the longest continuous street in America. So which of these facts is not true? All right, you guys are correct. We do not have the most national parks of any state. That's actually California. Um, I think we're technically third. But, so now you see how the kind of voting works. And then the other thing that we'll do is an open-ended question and you'll type in, in what state or country did you grow up? And then you'll see it pop up on the screen. Indiana, Texas, Arizona, Colorado natives, New Jersey, Texas, Massachusetts. You guys are from all over. <laughs> it's a perfect Colorado soup. <laughs> all right, so you get the gist. Now we will get into the transportation question. So we're gonna kind of structure it in those six topics that we talked about or that Jacob talked about. And it's just a couple simple questions. So. The first is, how well do you think that this 2050 RTP, the Regional Transportation Plan, will improve the safety of the regional transportation system? And then the second question is, knowing that all of these topics aren't equally important to everybody, uh, sorry, Freight, <laughs> uh, how important to you is the safety of the transportation system? So you're rating each of those questions from zero to 10, and it will pop up with a, um, the average of the group. And feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions or start discussion while we're doing this. Um, I certainly don't want to close off discussion. It's just um, we'll get through these interactive polling questions. All right, looks like safety is very important. That's what we've heard through all of this public and stakeholder engagement over this two-year process. Um, but it looks like maybe we're pretty middle of the road on how well the plan is going to improve it. So that's really good to hear. Okay. All right, so you'll see these questions. Oh, did I hear somebody wanting to talk? Okay, so you see the questions are framed the same way. The next topic is active transportation. So like Jacob said, that's anything that's not using a motor. So usually walking, biking, rolling, um, and also be scooters, things like that. How well do you think that the plan will improve active transportation in the region and how important is it to you? All right, still really important, but maybe not quite as far up there as safety. Looks like we're doing a little better on that than safety in the plan. All right. Third one is air quality. How well do you think the plan will improve air quality in the region? And how important to you is air quality? All right, another very important one. I think we all like to breathe cleanly. <laughs> um, and right around that five to six, um, six mark for the plan. All right, good to hear. Multimodal mobility. So like Jacob said, these are projects that have um, multiple uses. So roads, bikes, 
transit, um, really hitting those different modes. How well do you think that the plan is going to improve that and how important? All right, slightly, le slightly less important. That one's interesting and a little bit better than the other ones. All right. Then this is our last one. <laughs> Six very similar questions. Freight. Um, how well do you think it will improve freight movement and how important to you is freight? Yay, someone paid freight 10. <laughs> If you could tell from my freight jokes, I anticipated that it would be a little bit lower than the other ones. It's a very important part of our region, but maybe not as important to everybody's life um, every day. And then right at the middle with the five with freight movement, the plan. All right, so that kind of goes through the ranking questions. Now I really, oh wait, forgot transit. <laughs> Most important, sorry, thought freight was last. How well do you think that the RTP will improve regional transit? And how important to you is regional transit? All right, another very important one. That's, that's what we've heard throughout. 9.3 for regional transit, 6.3 for the plan. I'm kind of in that middle road, but maybe a little bit higher than the others. All right. That was our last one. <laughs> this one more general. So just generally thinking about all of those topics and we all have kind of a vision, especially you all who think about transportation a lot. Um, how well does the, the plan align with your ideal transportation system when you think of where the Denver region should be by 2050? How well do you think this plan is gonna get us there? Looks like very mixed results. <laughs> Powerful. All right. See some extremely well, some very well, and not so well, and some some and a somewhat well. All right. So I'm gonna draw out a little bit more about why that is, or why you answered that way. So we have some open-ended questions. You can type in as many as you want. It will kind of pop up on the screen. Um, but also at this point. Really feel free to unmute and start talking if you don't want to type it into your phone. But we're just going to ask kind of a least and most. So first is, in what areas does the plan least align with your ideal transportation system? Where did you notice maybe we're falling short or where you think that there should be a little more priority? I think I have a just a comment, um, and it kind of refers to the first question in in the in all of the sets that you asked. Is that I don't know that I've seen enough detail with the plan to to gauge how well it will meet in any of these things. Um, but for those for those questions where you um, where I rated high, it was because it was clear that you're talking about it and not just assuming that you know what needs to happen. And uh, so I think that the fact that you are seeking input and you're looking for driving uh, multimodal and active transportation and clean air, I think if, they, if we were to ask that question 30 years ago, I'm not sure those items would have been on the table. Uh, perhaps they would, I don't know. but. Um, the fact that you are asking those questions to me implies that at least uh, there's a it's a better shot that those items will be included in the plan than than had you not brought them up. That's a really great point. and uh, definitely um, apologize that the the plan isn't quite ready for you to see the whole thing to really give your full input at this point. Um, but that's that's why we're hoping you'll engage again once it's. Um, out for the public and you can review it more thoroughly and um, and answer those questions. But I think that's just a really 
you hit on a really important point that these are topics that have not always been priorities. Um, I, I, I don't pretend to know what was in every single Dr. Cog regional transportation plan, but I'm pretty sure this is the most emphasis that's ever been put on bike or pedestrian. And safety is certainly newly very important at many different levels from ranging down from federal level as well. But there's such an emphasis recently um, with safety and programs like Vision Zero and things like that. So it's certainly a new, um, the topics are, are emerging priorities for sure. And that's what we've been hearing through this process. And I think that that is why this process exists is for us to check back in with the community and see what's important and what re where we really need to get to with the, our transportation system. Being so, so, since that opens it up, maybe just any additional comments from other transportation advisory board members there? Yeah, Jacques? Yeah, I was just gonna uh, quickly say thank you for uh, bringing the presentation tonight. This is excellent. And I thought it was very key that on almost every topic, it was ranked very high as a priority for people who took the poll. So I think you hit on the right uh, key indicators there. It'll be interesting once we kind of evolve to the next step, which is how do we take this vision and then drill down into how do we know we're succeeding? Uh, as a data person, that's always on my mind, which is what are we going to measure our work against? Are we going to measure the emissions? Are we going to measure number of cars? You know, how are we going to measure it? And of course, that's the next step and that'll further guide us. But I think this is excellent and I really appreciate you guys doing the roadshow uh, and coming out virtually. Thanks, Jack. I, I want to throw that actually to Governor Alvin because we do have a big performance measures part of the plan, but definitely not something that I am <laughs> yet the expert in. So I'm going to have them talk about how we measure. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, if Alvin's not able to chime in, I can answer it. Well, let me go ahead and Alvin, if you're still here, feel free to jump in any time. Um, yeah, there's so much in this plan. You know, it's ironic. We we set out with a goal when we put this plan document together that we wanted it to be shorter and punchier and, and more publicly accessible. And I think when you see it next week, um, I think you will definitely pick up on that. It is the best designed and I think most engaging regional transportation plan that we've ever done. But it turns out it's actually longer than our last plan, which is not what we intended. It's actually slightly longer. And then it has 19 appendices, which is a lot. It sounds like a lot and it is a lot. So this is a little bit like drinking from a fire hydrant. So a lot of the things you're bringing up, we really appreciate and we didn't have a chance to sort of get to in our presentation. This is one of them. So when it comes to performance management, I'll just try and summarize really, really briefly. Um, there's several ways that we do it, but probably two of the most important are, um, I think it was Alvin that mentioned our overall Metro vision plan, which is our aspirational kind of regional vision plan. We do have quantitative um, measures and targets in that plan, you know, relating to things like vehicle miles of travel and mode share to work and greenhouse gas emissions um, and safety and, and several other topics. And those, those are really, really important to us. And you'll see in chapter four of this plan, we actually talk about, you know, both how this plan, it's it's hard to model some of this stuff or forecast some of this stuff. So we can't do that for every Metro Vision measure, but you'll see in chapter four next week that it talks about how this plan relates to Metro Vision and frankly, how we're, how we're proposing to amend Metro Vision um, to bring it even more in line with some of the things that we've talked about tonight. So for example, for safety, you know, I mentioned that we did a safety plan, a regional Vision Zero plan. We committed in that plan as a target of zero uh, for fatalities and serious injuries. That's an amendment that we're going to make to MetroVision based on uh, that work and based on the regional transportation plan. The other thing quickly that we do around performance uh, management is there's a whole raft of federal requirements that is known as transportation performance management. And there's five sort of buckets of areas, which I won't get into, but five themes of things around congestion and safety and others that transit um, and others that they have us measure. One of the appendices in this plan is actually what we call a system performance report um, that talks about, you know, those federally required things, how we measure those and how this plan kind of squares up with those. Thanks, Jacob. All that to say there will be lots of good data for you to dig into in the full plan when you see it, Jacques. Thank Great. you. One, one quick follow-up question there for me, Lisa, and um, um, and uh, Alvin, if, if you're there, and uh, to Jacob. I, I realize this is a long-term plan, 
Well, this has been such a extraordinary 2020, you know, post 2020 timeframe that we've seen one of the, the, the largest shifts in, in transportation probably in decades where people actually really made work from home a necessity. Um, to what extent does Dr. Cog currently get involved with any sort of, you know, transportation infrastructure is really expensive, um, but being able to, to try and do public awareness and public encouragement and public influence campaigns as it relates to encouraging, you know, more transportation demand management along the lines of working from home, it seems like that's a missed opportunity here, given the huge shift in, in, in behaviors we've seen over the last year. Is that, to what extent is, is that, um, that, that, that Dr. Cog even gets in, involved in, in, in general and, and is that, has that shifted at all in the last year? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll start an answer um, and then I'll defer to Lisa to, to help me answer it. Short answer is both in this plan specifically and in Dr. Cog generally, you know, this whole sort of framework of let's call it transportation demand management or TDM is actually a really important part of the plan and the work that we do at Dr. Cog. Uh, we actually have an entire program at Dr. Cog called the Way to Go uh, program dedicated to that very notion and, and the work around that. Um, and that's what I'll defer to Lisa to in a moment. She can probably talk about it better than I can. But for, for anyone who doesn't know Dr. Cog in this region, when we say, well, we work for Dr. Cog, well, what's that, a doctor's office? The one thing that they might know us for is Bike to Work Day. That's one of our signature events, and it's one of the showpieces of, um, but certainly actually a small part um, of the work that we, around, we do around transportation demand management. Specifically in the plan, we did a lot of work around that issue. We did a whole scenario analysis uh, piece of work that I didn't even have a chance to mention tonight um, and won't go into now. Um, but the bottom line is in terms of how it showed up in the plan is that there is, you'll find that in chapter two of the plan. And I think you'll find some references in chapter three uh, that talk about the importance of providing um, alternative means of transportation, including telework, uh, meaning not making that trip at all. Uh, we actually, in our regional traffic model that we use as part of this plan, uh, make some assumptions around telework um, and in, in sort of increasing those um, assumptions around telework based on what we've seen in the pandemic and based on the likelihood, although no one knows for sure, um, that at some level it's probably going to continue at a higher level um, than it has in the past. So again, you know, apologies in the sense that that's yet another topic that we weren't able to sort of touch on initially, but um, I can assure you when you see the plan, you will see uh, that work in there. Great. It just seems like a, a particularly timely topic there and one where you can really move the needle at just the right time here. Absolutely. And just to add on, I'm going to switch to the, well, the next question is the more positive version of this one, um, which is what areas does the plan most align? And feel free to just drop in um, your comments as we did on the last one. But just to follow up on what Jacob said, um, our way to go program has been working on alternative ways to commute for, I don't know, 20 years. Um, but this in the last year, they've really focused just on telework. Um, so we have a telework tomorrow campaign, which is provides we're working a lot with large employers around the region um, to provide telework resources to them and kind of um, assist in whatever they need to make telework an option for their employees. Um, so that's where we put our focus there for the last year. Um, it's really on telework and I do think one important thing about the plan is that we update it every four years. So it's it's a snapshot in time of this crazy last year, but it also evolves and is this long term, you know, how it, it remains to be seen exactly how much our commuting patterns will be changed. I personally hope <laughs> that I'm able to telework more in the future um, once we get back to normal. And I hope that that will be the case for a lot of people and that that, that could be a really huge shift in our transportation system in the region. Yeah, I certainly think so there. I can tell you that my organization used to have uh, 30 people driving to work there. Now we only have 14 people driving to work there because 16 people who can work from home are now working from home. I don't think any of them would view it as telework. So maybe um, I wonder if there's a more modern term that uh, we could consider moving forward, but for future discussion. Any that's a great, that's a really great point. I kind of have the same, same thing. It's the WFH, work from home, a lot more than I use uh, telework as a term. Any additional comments here before we uh, jump to the next topic there? Yeah, Liz. Uh, what you just said, Neil, made me think that 
perhaps information infrastructure needs to be considered at least tangentially to transportation. Thank you. Timely. Any additional thoughts? Yes, Andy. I, I just thought it was excellent, the information that you gave us. And like um, was mentioned, we didn't have enough time to really focus in on the depth and breadth of what you've got. And I look forward to going online and reading more. But, you know, it's so important and it's a personal responsibility for each one of us as individuals, as well as corporate to make these decisions to make our air quality and our safety on the roads and the um, a multimodal transportation options. We all have to own it to get it to work. So thank you for the good work. And I look forward to seeing how things progress in the months and weeks and years ahead. So thank you. Sounds thank you. Good. Thanks. Liz, you'll get the last word in this one. One thing I mentioned in the thing that was missing, in my business, I am touching on a lot of non uh, manned aircraft, non-manned delivery, non-manned robots kind of things. And I was hoping that either in transportation or multimodal, that by 2050, we're going to have an awful lot of these things and that needs to be planned for. And it seemed to have been missing. And I think we need to be thinking about all these new ways that are going to be interacting with transportation in the future. Thank you. Yeah, just if I could respond to that real quick, really appreciate that point. It's a really important point. Yet another thing that we didn't have time to touch on tonight. One of the many appendices of the plan is something called Mobility Choice Blueprint um, that we did about a couple of years ago. And that was a project in partnership with um, CDOT, RTD, the Denver Metro Chamber, local governments and others to really look at the very issue that you're raising around what is the what's the role and what's the potential impact of technology on mobility in the future. Um, so, you know, drones, autonomous vehicles, you know, all those buzzwords that we hear, but really an in-depth look um, at how, you know, how we can start preparing for that over time. And Dr. Cog has initiated some programs and work groups based on um, that work to carry that forward. Um, so you'll see that in the plan as well. Again, it's another thing uh, we weren't able to, to give its uh, due diligence or, or due, um, um, you know, due process in terms of our conversation tonight, but you will see that in the plan as well. Awesome. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Alvin. Just in closing there, if anybody uh, would like to get a little more information uh, about Dr. Cog's activities, what's uh, the best website to be able to uh, get that additional information? So just our homepage, drcog.org, will have information, but um, there you'll see the link through to the, the online on-demand open house and all of the things that we've created to try to give you a good virtual experience of this plan. So, and we'll be sure to pass on um, once the plan is released, we'll we'll pass on the information to Tyler and Phil, and they can share with you so you have a more direct link too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you all for your time. Great. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. We're going to move forward to uh, the next agenda item, which is the Equitable Carbon Free Transportation Roadmap. And Phil and Francie, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thank you very much, Chair and Board. Uh, again, Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont, joined with my Francie Jaffe today, um, and she can give you her title. Uh, since I can't memorize all that, uh, all those fun words that she has in her title. Hi, all. I, my title is Water Conservation and Sustainability Specialist. Yes. Um, and as <laughs> Phil mentioned, I'm Francie Jaffe. And then also Tyler Stamiak was a critical part of this uh, roadmap as well. So I just want to give him some props of helping us work through this, uh, this, this effort as well. So you'll see on the title page here that we're talking about the equitable carbon free transportation roadmap and, and that there's a lot in that. So we'll try to unbundle that a little bit for this group and, and talk about that. Um, it really is the idea of we have a, a lot of things that are in current planning efforts today that do a lot of the equity the carbon free piece and, trans and through transportation. And so this roadmap is really trying to put all those pieces together. And we did include this slide because we wanted to show that this, there was, uh, we did work with, if you wanna go back to Francie, um, just to explain that we did work with a consult, 
three consulting group, well, one consulting group that had uh, three parts to it. And they did put this together and they helped us out. Um, but when we got it at the end of the day, quite frankly, staff was, um, we really felt like there needed to be more to it and, and put more kind of meat on the bones for that piece to happen. So we kind of took it over just in full disclosure um, because you did hear from some of these folks a, a number of months ago, they came and, and did speak to you uh, as, uh, and, let you, and let you know what was going on with this project. And so I just wanted to let you know kind of where we're at on that. And we did take it over and we finished it up as staff. Uh, we actually made it much more succinct, we think. So in your packet today, you'll see 18 pages of, of our plan. So thanks, Francie, if you could turn to the next one. So as I mentioned before, we really did take a number of our plans and this doesn't show all the plans that we worked from. This just shows a kind of a snippet of the different plans that we've been working over the years on. But they all had something that had to do with um, equity. It may not have called it out specifically because that term's really been um, used more maybe in the last couple of years than, than when some of these plans were done. Uh, but they all had a carbon free piece to it as well that there was that we were trying to get um, better air quality. And then we're trying to do that through our transportation system. So reduce um, reduce uh, single occupant vehicle travel through a variety of modes. So this is what the roadmap is really leading us to is, is all these different pieces of these plans and putting them all in one place. So again, the goals were really to reduce those emissions and in, and in doing so, you know, that's there, there's a lot of different ways to do that. And so we talked about increase the vehicle electrification across the city. And that starts with us with the city of Longmont. So one of those items is really to make sure that we're looking internally when we're talking about vehicle electrification, but also incentivize it across the city. So there's those different things and to incentivize it um, so it is equitable so that different people who may not be able to afford a new electric vehicle are able to uh, get an electric vehicle through in, uh, other financial means possibly offered to the city and or, or through private firms. So that we've got a lot of goals that kind of reach out about that and then reduce the single occupancy vehicle miles of traveled. I talked about that and that really talks about shifting the modes. We'll talk about that later and then obviously increase that air quality and make, make, uh, make our air better for everyone. Next slide. Thanks. So we do this through um, talking about guiding principles and really we're going to probably change this slide around. So you could, I hate to say this to the TAB, but you're kind of our guinea pigs here with, uh, we're trying to, uh, this is the first time this, uh, this presentation has been taken out to public and, uh, and we're pretty excited about how this actually rolls out. But the idea is that really the, the four pieces on the right side of this, of this guiding principles piece is really the foundation. So the equity priorities are the foundation of everything that we're working from. So, um, Maybe I'll turn it over to Francie at this point and just talk a little bit more about those equity priorities and how they kind of create that foundation for this piece. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, so we have four main equity priorities. Um, so the first one is connect. So that focuses on ensuring activity and stability for all members of our community. The second one's include. So under include, you have include uh, various languages, cultures, um, abilities in the development and implementation of projects. Kind of part of that is not just um, making sure that projects are accessible, but how do we include all community voices in the development of projects? Uh, the third one is barriers. Um, address cost burdens and eliminate barriers around access to programs and job opportunities. And then the last one is safety. Um, so identify and resolve actual and perceived safety concerns. We thought uh, both actual and perceived um, was an important thing to highlight because during our engagement process, um, individuals highlighted that um, even if it is statistically safe, if people do not perceive it as safe, they may not use it. Um, all four of these um, really kind of are the building blocks for how we um, create our and actually reduce our carbon emissions because if we're not being inclusive of all members of our community, then we're not going to reach um, all of our goals if only some of the community can participate. 
So thank you. Um, so really this gets to our goals and you'll see this in the document is, is, you know, we already have a stated goal that greenhouse emissions need to be cut by 69% by 2050 in the city. That's all GHG, that's all greenhouse gas goals. And then we're also looking at a statewide plan that was just released recently. It was also called a, a roadmap. And it um, it refers back to that 12, six, the House Bill 1261 that Jacob mentioned a number of times in his presentation with Dr. Cog. And that was actually, um, you know, in that in that program, they actually mentioned that, or they don't just mention, they they are they are striving toward reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector by 96% in 2050. So a lot of that has to go with this as well. So those equity priorities that the Francie talked about, and then the base strategies of shorten and reduce the number of trips and shifting modes, and then reducing those direct vehicle emissions are very critical to kind of sit on top. And that's what the new slide will hopefully show us is, uh, is kind of how those work together. Next slide. So here's the roadmap. <laughs> Um, we actually are working on this as well at, at this time. We've got, uh, we, we hope it's a little cooler, more interesting, and more like a trail map maybe than a road map, but and getting people out of their vehicles. But this really does talk to the ideas that the road map is getting us from year to year to year um, in different segments. And we really start with the base goals in 2021. And uh, we kind of move from there talking about what we're doing already with the EV charging stations, street safety, we're working toward uh, you know, safer streets, the financial incentives that are already in place through lower um, low income housing and those different things. And then we're already doing a lot with EV education where we're the electric vehicle education piece where we're letting people know kind of what's out there and what kind of incentives there already are out there from the state uh, especially. So we're doing that. But in the next two years, we really have to start talking about how we, um, you know, embed more equity into the into the discussion. Um, and I'll let you read through those different things. But the other piece is, that's pretty important is the Go EV resolution. I'll let Francie talk a little bit about what that means and, and uh, what the timing is on that. Yeah, so the Go EV resolution is a resolution that has been going around um, the state, but um, a different group is bringing that to different communities. Um, but we wanted to recommend a very long month specific because what might work well in a different community for a Go EV resolution might not work best for Longmont. Um, so this is really, we don't have currently any specific goals um, for zero emission vehicles. We don't have a goal around percentage by the city. So the, the Go EV resolution, um, is something that would be a decision by city council um, but it would actually have maybe uh, have some more specific goals. And I do want to highlight that even though this is called a Go EV resolution in Longmont, um, we do like, as you can see, zero emission first fleet, um, want to make goals around zero emission vehicles, um, as even though electric vehicles uh, are, once we have 100% renewable energy, will be a zero emission vehicle. There are other zero emission vehicle opportunities um, that could come up over time already with current technology a lot of our waste services be by renewable natural gas so we didn't want to just limit it to electric vehicle yeah thanks Francie. so then we move along from 2023 which is kind of that two year in the next two years what can we do how do we start climbing that ladder to get to zero uh, or to 96 percent reduction in some cases or that 69 percent reduction of all greenhouse gases, uh, that's the city goal. And so the next step is really taking it for that more five-year plan from today and more into the capital improvement program that I think you're keenly aware of. So um, I won't talk too much about that, but getting in, getting programs into that capital improvement program that really, um, and, and it doesn't show necessarily in, in the, the specific projects here, but that is that five-year timeframe that we're looking at. But we're also looking at, um, you know, having some, very exciting new projects online, specifically the new transit hub at First and Main and bus rapid transit, uh, opening up that micro mobility piece so that there's more availability to different micro mobility pieces like um, electric bicycles or shared electric bicycle programs, uh, possibly shared electric scooter programs, uh, and then some smaller uh, vehicles 
We have Via that works within Longmont and they have some smaller vehicles that they use to get people around. So um, just those kind of things. And then just expanding those different education pieces and those incentives that we talk about. Then we kind of move into the mid-year piece of this plan, you know, halfway home kind of thing where we talk about um, really in completing those EMUX or enhanced multi-use corridor uh, pro plans and, and, and uh, different facilities that we have planned. We really hope to have that done uh, you know, between 10, 15, 20 years from now. So that's what we're looking for for that. Uh, be well, before 2035, I should say. And then those more accessible bus routes, just so that people have more access to the actual routes. If that means that the bus is running more often, that's, that, that's one thing. Uh, making stops more convenient for users. And then we talk about the, e the electric vehicle workforce development. And so Francie, if you wanna talk maybe a little bit more about what that entails. Sure. So as we move um, from combustion vehicles to electric vehicles, and this is just one example, this could apply for a number of different things of a multimodal system, but we may, uh, there may be need for training of new mechanics or current mechanics. How do we make sure that they are prepared to work on different types of cars or in different situations, especially for moving away from cars and trying to promote people to walk and bike more? So how does that workforce transition? So this, this kind of looks at um, how do we work with our school and the innovation center and local, the maybe Front Range Community College to look at kind of EV workforce development and partner um, with those organizations to make sure we have ac accessible workforce development and kind of transitioning um, kind of our workforce that works on maybe uh, combustion vehicles to more electric vehicles or other uh, multimodal transportation. Thanks. And then that kind of home stretch piece is really talking about having a complete and interconnected bicycle system. So basically wherever you're crossing an arterial street, uh, that's that should be done at a, at a, um, at a grade cross or a, a grade cross or a, grade separated crossing, excuse me. And so we're talking about really connecting that bicycle system. So there really are no islands of, of, uh, of the city where people are kind of feeling separate or locked in with bound with, with the different barriers that we talked about earlier, specifically kind of the street system and some of those things so that you're comfortable and safe on your bicycle uh, throughout the city. And then deploying that residential EV charging program, basically having EV chargers as part of the and they they are they really have already are part of the current building code that's uh, well the, the next iteration of the building code. We really make sure that those get inside all the building, all the residential buildings, so everybody has access to that. And then replace your ride EV program, kind of like uh, you know I hate to say it, but cash for clunkers was kind of a popular program too. This is kind of that idea of replacing your ride with an EV or an electric vehicle, so that. We think that all those programs combined, they're all, again, in different parts of different plans. So we're not really reinventing the wheel here. What we're doing is just taking the different pieces from all the different plans that are out there, uh, including Envision Longmont, the sustainability plan, the EMUT plan, and putting them together so that they make, that they kind of guide us to reducing the carbon emissions based on uh, council direction. So those have all kind of been happening. And, and so that's that's the roadmap. What I'll do is we'll go to the next slide and just ask you, show you what we're asking from you, specifically a uh, request from the board. Um, staff's recommendation is obviously that you recommend the city council accept this uh, equitable carbon-free transportation roadmap and the recommend recommendations therein. Uh, we also have some other pieces for you that uh, uh, you can certainly go forward with as well. Recommend that city council accept the the plan with additional feedback or direction that you may have. So that's that's great. We'd love to take that today. Or recommend that the city council not take action on this plan at this time. Maybe it's not ready for prime time, but again, it's all the things that are kind of going on in various plans already. So with that, uh, we'd love to open it up for questions. Hopefully we'll give you enough time. We try to do about a quarter of the slides that Dr. Cog had. So um, hopefully that <laughs> worked out. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Phil, and thank you very much, Francie. Um, any clarifying questions or comments from Transportation Advisory Board members? And maybe uh, uh, we can take it off the slide here just so we can actually see uh, uh, the rest of the faces there. So as the questions pop up, 
we can see who has the questions. Okay, David, do you want to go first? Um, just for a second, I have questions, but it was it was with regards to the handout. So um, I want to find the specific items and then maybe talk to those. Yeah, we were really hoping you were reading the plan that's actually a part of the attachment. That 18 page plan is yeah, yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, so give me, I'll be back in just a second after I find what I had to talk about. All right, Dave, we'll come back to you there. I saw some other questions or some other hands raised there for clarifying questions or comments. Um, Sandy? It's not clarifying questions, but I just wanted to say how much I appreciated you taking the time to give definition to what equitable was, carbon free, transportation roadmap. So we knew what you were talking about from the get go. And I, I, I personally appreciate that. So thank you. Recording? Um, yes, I just had a, a question about um, the percentage of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in the plan on uh, page 13 of the packet, it says 66% by 2030 and then 69% by 2050. It doesn't seem like there's a very big difference there. I mean, the state has it to do by 90% by 2050. I assume those came out separately and if they're is there a way we can try to get that higher or how did that number come about? Thank you for that question. Um, I can go ahead and answer that. So those um, percentages came from the 2016 sustainability plan, um, which at the time was approved by a, a different city council who I think had different priorities. So we were directed to usually you might set a goal and then see what your the objectives are to that goal. Instead, we were asked um, as, a, as to map kind of what was feasible and easily accessible within that time period. So the, the reason you don't see a large drop between 2030 and 2050, just be, it was more a lot of those maybe more reasonable bullet action items could be done in that 2030 time frame um and then it it would be a direction from city council if long enough to increase our greenhouse gas emission goals thank you and thank you so much for this is so much work and so much collaboration between multiple groups and find it amazing that uh i think this is actually attainable and i'm really excited about that Great. Yeah, Liz. And I'll echo the thank you. It was really a fun read. Um, I wanted to just add in the barrier section under uh, the equity priorities, what felt to me was two things that are missing. And I think that our lowest income, most vulnerable people face two barriers that weren't listed. And one is reliability. The question of whether will there be transportation available when I need it? Um, especially if being on time to work. And the other one is relative to that round the clock availability. We have a lot of shift work that happens in Longmont and a lot of our transportation systems aren't available to those people when they need to get to work or they need to come home from work. As a matter of fact, there's someone that maybe many of you have met at the McDonald's on Maine. I get up at 6.30 every morning and drive my little electric car to make sure she can get to work because there's not a reliable public method for her to get to work. And so I think that reliability and timeliness are things that have to be considered when we look at barriers. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great. Yes, Andy. On some of these, um, I'm wondering, you put a timeline, but I wonder why we're waiting so long, like um, electric uh, vehicle education, you have five years, 2026. 
why aren't we working um, now to have that happen quicker? I mean, I'm going to be dead before a lot of this happens, and I would like to see it happen before I die. So um, <laughs> I'm ready for things to move forward, and I realize that it's a lot of education that's necessary, but there are other things, you know, the bike um, paths and stuff that we know that are not connecting from one point A to point B or point A to point C, um, and I know it costs money, but it seems like maybe there is a better way of getting those things going so people get in their minds that we can ride our bikes or we can do those hover vehicles or um, whatever, um, or walk to get where we need to get instead of uh, relying on our cars um, or our um multiple trips places instead of just bundling our trips and, and going with neighbors or whatever. So. Yes, Sandy, just to answer that question, we do try to put the EV education throughout the document or through the, 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 the different time periods. So it's in there, but it is, we've had a difficult time on how you kind of grow it from simply telling people about the system or how, about what an electric vehicle is and how it works to that next level of education, you know, how you actually start to figure out how to acquire the electric vehicle and get it into your home and actually use it. And then there's other steps as well. So we, we try to keep those in different timelines, but I don't, you know, I think we've been struggling, I guess, with that too. And Francie, you might have more to add about that. Yeah, we do. We have, um, well, EV education first shows up and this started. We have mostly worked through uh, partner organizations and supporting them, um, but with the emphasis to um, kind of putting it up front there with the need to expand that. I think the EV education that's in the, and I'm looking to the side because I have my it up on the other screen. Um, in the five-year timeline, um, one of them was a design contest for to kind of make a, a vehicle rack to highlight our own electric vehicles. Um, we've been told by our, our, our fleet services that actually pay the cost to, the design contest is not cost prohibitive, but actually updating the rack on our vehicles can actually be a little bit more costly. Um, so I think that was put in the five-year timeline just to make sure we can factor in our budget and make sure um, we have enough budget and also hopefully in that time frame we'll also have more vehicles. I think we have a very small percentage now, but I have a larger percentage. So as Phil mentioned, we're trying to uh, integrate it uh, throughout and try to have different kind of points where it makes sense to expand EV education. And then one of the recommendations we had in the, the two years was hire a cultural broker because we think it's that having a specific staff member who is a cultural broker will really help expand our education. Wonderful, thank you. Great, Jacques, and then maybe we'll see if there's a, a motion to uh, uh, approve as is or, um, or, or approve uh, with changes there. And, and David, we'll, we'll, we'll do your question first before uh, we go to that vote there, Jacques. Uh, yeah, and this one's just quick. Um, and and Francie, I, uh, when you talked about the bus wraps, it brought me back to when I had to buy bus wraps. So I understand that process. <laughs> um, I was looking at the equity priorities because I think equity is really going to become a big topic over the next four years. Um, and I really like the way we've had safety barriers, which I think barriers is a big one, um, inclusion which I think is really good to start uh, with that broker that you were talking about. And then connect, at first I looked at connect and I was kind of feeling vague on it. Like what does connect actually mean? Um, but then I started thinking about it and I think this is actually one of the biggest here is this connectivity and connecting to the community. I almost wanna throw the word community in there because I think of our paths that we have and some of them are in disarray connecting to a community on a neighborhood sponsoring a cleanup effort something like that i think is can be a very powerful way to empower equity 
and to connect. And I don't want to get that lost in there because I, I think that there is there there is a potential there to add a little bit to that community piece. So there's just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. David, you'll get the last word and then we'll invite a motion. Okay. The um so uh, so I'm looking at the uh uh PDF with the uh metrics. And it shows, you know, steps versus goals and priorities. And street safety shows up three times, and in none of them are base are any of the base goals selected as being pertinent. And um, I think that that's a real disservice. That reducing car trips and miles go, go a huge distance to reducing pedestrian deaths um, and bicyclists. And, uh, you know, that the, the report we had on accidents, I was looking through it after I saw this, and it said, what, 50% of the, of the fatalities between 2015 and 19 were pedestrians. Um, so I think, I would think that reducing the number of cars on the road and how far they're driving would go a long ways to helping uh, uh, address some of that. So I think that that should be selected. And then I didn't see street safety on the on the uh, PowerPoint that you just provided. Um, so I think I think it should be there. Um, I oh, and then one other thing I was surprised at it's. One of the street safety things it says to continue to focus on moving towards zero deaths uh, and focus on safety improvements that align with Longmont's goals and development pattern. Now it sounds to me the way I read that is that we're already going to be doing some of this stuff, so it shouldn't cost much. But it says it's very expensive and it's hard. Except in the description it says we're already going to be doing it anyway. So, so it sounds like it should be cheap and easy. At least, at least that bullet. I mean, actually implementing it may be very difficult, but but this is just uh, this is a benefit that would come of this development. It's not the it's not the street safety isn't necessarily the reason why that it's being uh, why this project is happening. It's just a it's one of the out one of the outcomes. So. Um, I just would, I'm just trying to, I guess, elevate street safety into a more pertinent and plausible, feasible aspect in this plan. Right, and we just tried to identify where the different street safety pieces were in all the different plans that you'll see out it's, there. So it's on page 10 and page 12. Yeah, right, right. As you see, you know, we did mention it in the PowerPoint presentation as well as something that we've already started. It was the very first thing on our on our list because street safety is obviously one of the most critical pieces of it. I think you're correct though. We, we probably need to figure out where that goes into the base goals. So Francie and I can kind of take a look at that and make sure we're getting the base goals covered correctly where they need to be there. Um, and then the only piece that I would say is um, because of the fact that it's moving towards zero deaths and making zero deaths our goal in that, in that particular in that particular piece of Envision Longmont, um, moving towards zero deaths is going to be difficult because it's it's going to take a lot of resources, and and it is going to be difficult because it's so hard uh, to. And I think council got a brief uh, taste of this when they talked about it at the retreat last year. Is it's so difficult to eliminate all deaths from the street system just because of they're so you know. When you hear about the fatalities in a given year, which is you know hor horrendous to have to talk about, but when you hear about those different things, um, I think there's this the, there's this idea that, gosh, there's no way we're going to be able to get rid of all those deaths, and this, this is more of one of those goals that you just try to you need to aspire to because um, the aspirational goal of zero deaths, because you're not going to say, you know, Dr. Cog, you know, they were they were on our earlier piece here. And they were great about um, talking about all these different things, but they used to have aspirational goals to go from, you know, 250 deaths per year to like 150 deaths per year. Well, we didn't think 
you know, to hear that in a comment, like our aspiration is to go, you know, cut our deaths in half or by three quarters is, is, is not an aspiration. We want zero deaths sure. on our street system. Yeah. They do too now. So we're all working toward that, but it's going to be very difficult. Well, that right. I understand it would be, but but in that case, we should probably rephrase the thing, the goal, or the the, ter the text says it's in, it in lines with our current goal and our development pattern, and and it doesn't sound like it really does. So okay. I would maybe scratch that last part and just say continue to focus on moving towards zero deaths. Period. And that is hard, and that is expensive. It's that last piece that makes it like it. Sounds like it shouldn't be. Okay. It's only a small part of what we normally be doing. I understand what you're saying now. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. That's all I have. Nick. Great. So uh, staff has asked us to uh, consider a motion uh, where we could. You now, obviously, they'll take the uh, the feedback to heart here, and uh, we'll we'll look at incorporating things. Uh, but I think we've got a pretty good idea of the big picture of of the plan. Is there? Uh, motion that we would like to entertain as it relates to uh, uh, endorsing uh, the equitable uh, carbon free transportation roadmap. Anybody like to make a motion? Okay, I'll make a motion that we uh, we go ahead and accept the plan. Uh, but then they consider the comments that have been made this evening. Okay, so moved. Is there a second? This is Joe. I'm not aware of our three options. Which one did that fall into? I think number two. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, sounds good. Second from uh, Joe. Any comments on that before we go to a vote? Okay, hearing none. All in favor, raise your hand or uh, signal in some other way. Okay, Looks like widespread support. All right, hands down. Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion passes. Congratulations and well done, team. Thank you very much for your support tonight. We appreciate that. Absolutely. All right. Really cool to see that plan moving forward. All right, comments from board members. So uh, why don't we uh, just go in the order people happen to be on, on my particular screen. It's probably different than the order on your screen, but Joe, we'll start with you and then David and Jacques and go from there. Uh, really the <laughs> only comment that I have is probably well worn um, recency bias. So this weekend, uh, prime time travel, the train matter. Uh, there was a five minute wait um, train to debark and we had some pretty serious traffic blockages. So again, I say it's probably well worn, um, but I, I guess as traffic increases, population increases, it's only going to worsen. So I guess beat the dead horse, but what, what plans do we have within the broader plan to address that? Bill or uh, Tyler, any insight in the mind to be of uh, being Yeah, sure. Thanks. So I think, you know, one of the best, unfortunately, there's very little we can do to regulate rail in terms of how they operate and do business. There is a form that I can share as well that you can report any blocked crossings, and FRA is looking at and reviewing those. I don't know what action may come of that, but it is something, a place where you can log those comments and concerns, and FRA is going to review them. Um, BNSF has another, um, you can call their local mixed results on whether what you get for response from calling their local number. It's the type of, it, I have to assume that other municipalities have type of issue. Um, is it pretty much the same answer across the state that it's the railroads control and they'll deal with it if they're so inclined? It is. Um, 
you know, part of, I know Fort Collins is the, sa the same train runs up through Loveland and Fort Collins. And I know that Fort Collins is working on some ways. Actually, they're recently their prior traffic engineer contacted me asking if there was a way we could work together in terms of providing notification when the super, the really long trains are coming. Mm -hmm. Part of what SF has been doing in the last year or so is running what they call super trains. So they're, it's basically their backhaul trip with empty containers, and they are piecing together mile long trains that unfortunately block crossings for a long time. And so some discussions with Fort Collins in the past about is there a way that we can share information to, to provide notification? Hey, 45 minute long or mile long train headed your way. And we'd have some notification between the two cities in terms of when it gets there. Um, similar discussions we've had a little bit with Boulder in terms of that way we maybe have an idea on both ends if and when trains are coming. Um, how do we best use that information and show that to, to the community? Not sure yet, but just some discussions that have been happening. Thank you for that. Great. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, David, do you want to go next? Thank you. I, I don't have anything else to add. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jacques. Um, not a ton to add. No, I, I, I guess just really briefly, I don't want us to forget about our local transportation and, uh, you know, current, we have the contract with R2D for the free, uh, bus service. And when we talk about equity and we talk about investments in North Longmont, all these things start to swirl in my head and reducing emissions. And it all kind of comes back to what are we going to do? for an equitable solution that serves the population that really rely on that local transportation, um, but do it in an efficient and a hopefully non-emission manner. Um, so there's, those are my musings. Thank you. Good musings, thank you. Awesome. Um, great, Courtney? Uh, I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Liz, anything from you? I just want to thank the person that takes the notes. They do a great job, and thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Jane. Awesome, Sandy. I just thought it was a good meeting and I don't want us to forget the lady that called in that lives in North Longmont that's concerned about the sidewalks because uh, uh, that's a scary thing having fast traffic and running up and knocking down um, fences. So Absolutely. anyway, it was a good meeting. Thank you. I, I, I believe Tyler will uh, do some due diligence there and uh, we'll come back to uh, the TAB when uh, to, to do a little digging into uh, his research there. I forgot to mention too that you know, and we we, we talked about it right after the call, and I failed to mention it in my in my presentation. But part of the equitable piece of the equitable carbon free transportation roadmap is to really look at how we um, spend money across the system and who who benefits and who who's not. And and if we're going to talk about uh, carbon free. And we're talking about people who don't maybe have access to cars or vehicles, making sure that they get a bulk of the of the projects uh, to support that, that system. So sorry to not mention that earlier. Thank you. Okay, only thing I'll add on my side is um, first huge thanks to uh, uh, our, our transportation staff here for adding um, a speed radar over on third and. Uh, I guess it's by third and Francis. Um, there is now a little device to let you know how fast uh, uh, people are traveling right in front of the West uh, Side Tavern. Uh, it was an area where I definitely had some uh, uh, some times where where people were crossing the street, but when you have cars parked on the road, it's kind of hard to be able to, to to fully see all the cars coming and all the people who are coming across there. So uh, that little. Uh, uh, you know, speed sign there lets you know how fast you're going there is definitely a good reminder to slow down. So thank you for making that happen. I mean, responsive to the feedback here uh, uh, some months back. One quick question though, uh, the St. Vrain Greenway, I, I know over the course of the last year, we've had an, an extended 
um, detour that uh, was going around, I guess it was around uh, South Pratt, um, uh, just recognizing some of the construction that was going on there. And um, I don't know if uh, uh, Phil or Tyler might be able to just give a quick update in terms of um, what do you anticipate that section of uh, the greenway opening again, um, uh, if it's not already open. Sure, so I think the next phase is anticipated here sometime in February. Um, I think we're anticipating early part of February, but I think it's delayed a couple of weeks at this point. And there'll be a couple a, a couple of interim phases right now. I think the next phase is to, um, the way the construction is lying out, unfortunately the underpass under the railroad tracks won't be open for a little bit, about another month longer than we had hoped. And so, We'll have an interim condition before that opens. Once that opens, then we'll go into another round of detours, unfortunately. But um, it'll be a much shorter detour once that underpass is open and available. So we're doing everything we can to get to that. Right. So you, but do you anticipate that finally being complete in 2021? 20, yeah, the, the underpass, not the whole project. So we'll get to the underpass. The underpass will be open, access to get into the tracks. And then, like I said, I'm a shorter detour route at that point. Okay, thank you. Awesome, did I miss anybody? I think that was everybody. Okay, great. Awesome, Council Member Peck, uh, any comments on your side? Um, yes, I would just like also to thank the Transportation Department. I think they're, they're uh, awesome. <laughs> they're constantly working on ways to make long ride better. And uh, they, they always ask for input, which I think is really, really helpful. Uh, also, I'm going to be uh, logging into the RTD study session tomorrow. They're going to be discussing uh, that Northwest Corridor for Jared, Governor Pulse's, uh letter to them telling him he wants it completed by 2025. So we'll see what, what goes there. I, I personally think that's really important for our air quality because um, if passenger rail and Amtrak uh, can perform, give us what their what their mission is, we would have electric trains. So, um, you know, why why wouldn't we do that? So, I'll let you know how that goes. Awesome, thank you. Great. Um, so, if, looks like we have some upcoming transportation uh, related meetings there. I know. Uh, Phil gave a quick update earlier. Um, uh, Phil, is there anything else to add, or Tyler, anything else to add on the upcoming transportation related meetings? Well, I did. Want to, I did want to mention the RTD piece too, because you're all you can all join that if you'd like. So thank you, Councilmember Beck, for mentioning that. That was helpful because uh, we do. If you do want to kind of listen in on that study session, that would be wonderful to hear what the board members. From RTD are actually saying, um, and then we talked about the February 18th Boulder County piece, and I think that was in the chat. We'll send this all to you, or actually, Tyler sent us a, a link in the, in the email. I'll send you a link for, to the RTD piece as well, so you have that for tomorrow if you want to join. Um, and then we talked about February 26th being the Longmont Economic Development Partnership Summit, um, Advanced Longmont 2.0. So if you want to be part of that, uh, that's available too, I think, for people to join. Great. That was it for me, Tyler. Looks like Councilmember Peck has one thing, though. Uh, yeah, it is. I just wanted to say that that study session will begin at 5.30. Yes. Good point. Thank you. Sounds good. Well, we have a, a arch key agenda item there around uh, RT's annual report to Longmont. So that'll be uh, timely and interesting. Can't wait to hear what we uh, learn from there. Um, anything else pressing before we wrap up? All right, we will consider this transportation advisory meeting closed and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation uh, in March. Thanks everybody, have a good night. Thanks, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, so long.